Each year on November 1st, the Catholic Church remembers the many men and women who possessed great faith while they were alive and who now intercede for the faithful while in heaven. I am speaking, of course, of the saints. Different saints. For many Catholics, this means celebrating the lives of people like Patrick, Therese of Lisieux, Mother Teresa, Anthony of Padua, Francis and Dominic, Peter and Paul, the usual suspects. There are certain saints that everyone just knows and loves, and that's great. But there are literally countless men and women who have been canonized by the Church, their heroic lives and momentous faith lost to time. That is a shame. And so in this video, I've picked five saints that most people have never heard of to honor today. Let's reclaim some history. First on our list is Saint Zita, an Italian maid of the 13th century. For many, her life might seem altogether ordinary. From the age of 12 until her death 48 years later, she served the Fontanelli household in Tuscany, caring for domestic tasks. She never wrote a landmark treatise, didn't found an order of nuns, never built a school or orphanage, and most certainly didn't have any significant influence on the structure or doctrine of the church. She was, simply put, just a maid. Just a maid with incredible faith and steadfast devotion. Even at a young age, she used to rise hours before the rest of her family and other servants for mass and other prayers. Even though she was poor herself, she only ever kept a third of her wages, giving a third to her family and the other third to the poor. She took seriously her life as servant of others, striving to do even ordinary things in extraordinary ways. Unfortunately, this was not always well received by her peers, who resented her faithfulness and hard work. Even her family would overburden her with extra tasks to break her spirit. But this only revealed her holiness further. Remaining patient and kind, she never returned their resentment and it is said that she converted many of her servants through her generous love. In one legend, Zita is said to have left her work to care for a family in need. Trying to get her in trouble, her fellow servants informed their employer, only to find that angels had taken her place to bake bread. This was how well heaven revered her. Eventually, her generosity was so well known that she was put in charge of the employer's almsgiving, allowed to distribute what was necessary to the poor in the area. Although largely overlooked in modern devotion, she was among the most popular saints of the Middle Ages, with 150 miracles attributed to her life and intercession. In 1580, her body was exhumed and found to be incorrupt. In 1696, she was canonized a saint. Chances are you've never heard the next one on our list, but I can guarantee you know his work. Our second forgotten saint of history is Saint Odilo of Cluny, the originator of All Souls Day. Sort of. Born to a French aristocratic home in 962, Odilo was often neglected as a child because of his partial paralysis. It was not uncommon for him to be left outside on a stretcher, watching the luggage, because it was too difficult to bring him inside. On one such occasion, he felt so compelled by God to enter the church that he crawled all the way through the church to the altar, where he persisted in his attempt to stand. Miraculously, he found himself cured of his paralysis, an intercession he attributed to the Blessed Virgin Mary. Inspired by this devotion to Mary, Odilo joined the Benedictine Monastery in Cluny at the age of 29. Just three years later, he was ordained and made abbot of the monastery, a role he fulfilled for 55 years with tremendous success. Not only did he reform his own monastery, removing abuses and developing the spiritual life of those whom he served, his example of prayer and organization spread to other monasteries in France, Spain, and Italy. Beyond this, his charity was renowned as well. During a famine, Odilo sold the monastery's treasures to feed the poor. He is famous for having said, I would rather be damned for an excess of mercy than of severity. But beyond even that, Odilo is most remembered for the influence he had on the celebration of All Souls Day. Although prayers for the dead long preceded him, he was the first to establish November 2nd as a yearly date entirely dedicated to that purpose. Originally, it was established to remember the lives of deceased monks, but eventually became a universal holiday, not only for all the dead, but celebrated all throughout the Western Church. Next on our list is St. Jane Frances de Chantel, the founder of the Order of the Visitation of Mary. Although most known for her contributions to religious life, this was sort of a second vocation for her, as she lived for a very long time as a noble woman, the daughter of the President of the Parliament of Burgundy, and was married with children for nine years. Tragically, her husband was killed in a shooting accident, leaving her a single mother of nine children, six of her own, and three adopted after her sister's death. Almost immediately, she took a vow of chastity and met Francis de Sales, the then Bishop of Geneva. 
He became her spiritual director and eventually convinced her to found a new institute of women. Unlike most communities of nuns at the time, though, this one was a bit different. Not only were the women to live less strenuous lives outside of a cloister, something unheard of at the time, they were to be comprised of women of advanced age, delicate health, and complicated circumstances. In other words, women who would have been rejected by other convents. Over the next few decades, she lived a dual life, founding convents of women all over the country while continuing to care for her own children. By the time Frances de Sales died, the order had 13 houses, and by the time she died, it had 86. Unfortunately, the concept of the order was just a bit too new for the people at the time, and so it was criticized for being too lax and eventually brought under the rule of a cloister. But her sanctity was so well known that she received the praise of both aristocratic women and church leaders. The charism of her order continued to grow after her death, with 164 houses in existence at the time of her canonization. Going now a bit further back in time, we find the heroic work of one of the earliest missionaries of the church, St. Frumentius. Born in Tyre at some point in the 4th century, Frumentius witnessed immense trauma as a boy. Traveling with Syrian traders to Ethiopia, his ship was boarded by locals who murdered everyone aboard but himself and his brother. The two were taken into slavery, where they served the king of Aksum. But much like the biblical stories of Joseph and Esther, Frumentius found favor with the king, eventually converting him to Christianity. After the king died, he was entrusted with teaching the young prince and was given permission to evangelize in the country. Upon their release, his brother returned to Tyre to become a priest, while Frumentius traveled to Alexandria to petition Athanasius to send missionaries and a bishop to convert the Ethiopian region. His request was granted, but not in the way he imagined. Athanasius decided to ordain Frumentius a bishop and commissioned him to translate all of the Greek texts and symbols into the language of the Aksum people. A lesson to everyone. Be careful complaining and coming up with your own ideas. Someone will put you in charge. From then on, the church began to grow throughout all of Central Africa, leading King Azana to declare Christianity the official religion of the Aksumite Kingdom of Ethiopia. No doubt a lot of work went into this transformation, and who's to say it wouldn't have happened eventually in another way, but as history would have it, the Ethiopians came to faith because a boy from another country was made a slave and kept his faith. Pretty amazing. Finally, rounding out the list, we conclude with the most ancient saint in this video, Saint Serapia, a Syrian refugee responsible for converting another saint. Meaning that we're going to end here with a bit of a twofer. Bonus saint. Serapia grew up in Antioch at the end of the first century, just a few generations after the resurrection of Jesus. When Hadrian began persecuting Christians, her family fled to Italy, where she was soon orphaned. Rather than seeking a husband to start her own family, she decided to consecrate herself to God. To show her humility, she sold herself into voluntary servitude to a Roman noblewoman named Sabina, who, taken by her humility and charity, converted to Christianity. At some point, Serapia was forced to worship the Roman gods, which she refused to do. She was accused of being a Christian and beheaded. Sabina rescued her remains and had them interred in the family mausoleum, an act that later led to her own martyrdom. And unfortunately, that's really all we know about either saint. The sparse details of their lives make it difficult to build a significant devotion to either one, but I think it's important, given the heroism that they showed in the infancy of our faith, that we remember their names. Where would Christianity be today had people like them denied the faith and fled? We owe so much of what we have to their witnesses, regardless of how much is still remembered of them. And that's really the point of these saints. We can spend this year thinking about Francis and Dominic and all the big names, and we should. We are indebted to the influence they had on the church. But they're not the only ones. Our church is what it is today because of the immense faith of innumerable men and women over the past 2,000 years who have ensured that Christ was made present to the world. They are a reminder to us that we may never be remembered by future generations, but we can have a lasting impact on the world around us.